Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's March 6th and I want to do another round of questions from my patrons over at Patreon. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, these are all pretty much unrehearsed off the top of my head. Um, and yes, some people have started asking me about my favourite books, but that's way down the list now. I'm trying to do these in order. And I actually missed a question last time by uh, Rob Collins, who says... Hi Scott, I find it hard to understand zero gravity in a spaceship en route to the moon or Mars. It's within the planet's gravity field and if you're not in an orbit matching gravity with your forward velocity, why aren't you experiencing a portion of the planet's gravity? And Rob, I think this is sort of a basic misunderstanding of how you experience zero gravity in space. And a better term is free fall because when you're not applying engine thrust, the vehicle is free falling. And it turns out that a stable circular orbit is a form of free falling towards the Earth. So the reason why astronauts float around inside spacecraft is because they are experiencing exactly the same gravity as the rest of the spacecraft. Therefore, while they fall towards the planet, the spaceship falls towards the planet at exactly the same rate, so they pretty much appear to experience no gravity. But actually... The term microgravity is more correct because when you have something like the size of the International Space Station, not all parts of it are experiencing the same forces. Therefore, there are probably some corners of the space station where there are tiny, tiny forces due to the rotation of the station, gravity not being exactly right. Uh, and so, yeah, that's why we get microgravity. And so this applies regardless of whether you're in orbit or if you're headed off into deep space and within the gravity field of anything. Heck, it happens if you're falling towards a black hole. The only thing, again, if when I mentioned about microgravity, if you're falling towards a black hole or something where the tight, where the gravity field gets very strong very quickly, you might find that one end of your spaceship gets more gravity than the other. In fact, there's a book or a short story called Neutron Star by uh, Larry Niven where people can't figure out why this guy flying a spaceship was killed when he flew close to a neutron star. And so somebody else does it and they figure out, oh yeah, while this, the hull of the spacecraft was invulnerable, the gravity just tore everything apart inside it. Anyway, uh, yeah, Rob, that's that. So now moving forwards, the last question was about my career, which was actually quite easy. But there was another question there about why do matter, antimatter collisions convert their mass into energy? Boy, and it specifically says, a difference of only charge seems too simple. Electron and proton collisions don't create explosions. That's correct. But what you are doing is you're cancelling out not just the charge, you're carrying out, cancelling out the baryon number. And like, you're basically cancelling the matter, antimatter number. So if you cancel out everything, right, there's... All these particles are defined by uh, special numbers. So you have like the charge, you'll have things like quark charge, you'll, you know, which is like color charge. You, you might have your parity, uh, time vector, I, I forget, old spin, all these things. And when the antiparticle has exactly the opposite on all of these things. So if you want to convert something into energy, you have to cancel all of these things out Otherwise, you'll end up with numbers sitting around. So that's when uh, an electron hitting a proton doesn't cancel out because you're not cancelling out the baryon number and the lepton number. But with antimatter and antimatter, yeah, you cancel all that out and you get all that's left is the mass. And so you have to convert it into a particle which doesn't have charge, doesn't have baryon number or lepton number or colour charge. And you end up converting it into photons typically. Although if you start cancelling out things, the large particles like protons, you'll also get, uh, I believe, mesons and uh, stuff like that flying off. Those are, mesons are basically pairs of quarks and antiquarks. So you lose some energy. You'll also get neutrinos. So it's not a perfect conversion into energy that we can harness, but it's pretty close. It's very dense. That's the whole point. If my body was instantly transformed into antimatter, how big would the ensuing explosion be? Well... The Hiroshima nuclear device converted one gram of matter into energy. So if you are like 170 kilograms, uh, just, just it's 170,000 times the Hiroshima. Just, just do that math. But actually, <laughs> if your body was transferred into matter, antimatter, then 
the matter that was causing that explosion would come from the environment around you. So it'd be more like 340,000 times. It's a very, very big number. Wait, 700? Yeah, look, we're talking like gigatons. Ter it's very big, right? <laughs> oh, another question. Wow. I'm going to say Riley Adamson is asking a lot of questions. How does lightningmaps.org work? Uh, lightning Maps is a website where you can track where lightning is happening. And I believe there's two technologies. One is using like radar. They're basically looking for electromagnetic pulses and they can triangulate, maybe not triangulate, maybe they uh, use like distances. So it's trilaterate. The other thing is that there are weather satellites such as GOES um, 16, 17, I don't know. The ones that are currently flying, they now have lightning cameras on. In addition to the cameras that can map the entire globe or their hemisphere at like one kilometer resolution, those take about 10 minutes to take a whole image. But the lightning cameras focus and they can take uh, photos at much higher rate. They're more like a regular video camera and they can highlight, pick out the flashes and put those on a map. Obviously, they're not taking the whole video. They're just taking the points where the lightning happens. Okay, finally, on to the third question or third set of questions, right? By Janos Fikiti. Uh, that could say that wrong. Uh, I probably am saying that wrong. Apologies, but let's see what the question is. Hi, do you have more tales about visual spectrum space telescopes? Maybe astronauts trying to use real telescopes on the space station. What would it take to launch 20 centimeter Newtonian as a satellite just to take astrophotos? Okay, and did anyone do this already? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I think on the space station, they mostly actually use uh, cameras with really big lenses instead of telescopes. And they do take pictures of astronomical phenomena, but yeah, it's, it's you know, there's limits to what you can see. And mostly those cameras are used to take photos off the earth. Uh, launching 20 centimeter size Newtonia or telescopes they actually launched things like that. The cameras on most space probes are probably comparable in size. I know that the high-rise camera that's used to map Mars on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, it's like a 30 centimeter. They don't use Newtonians. They use uh, like Rishi Critian, where you've got mirrors, mirrors. The, the mirrors are all in line rather than deflecting off to the side. And they'll also use non-spherical uh, lenses or optics. So yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much what you'll find is that spacecraft, the cameras are pretty much fancy telescopes. Uh, <laughs> okay, talk about the history of the use of star navigation. Oh, oh goodness. Um, okay, well that will have to be a video if I ever get around to it. I'd love, I'd love to talk about navigating in space using the stars and using like. Um, you know, star sites and things like that. So, like, figure out how to navigate to a docking. That would be cool. Okay, Manfred Weber. I was wondering why SpaceX decided to do the flip maneuver for Starship so close to the ground in the flight profile. Why don't, aren't they already flipping at, say, 3,000 meters above the ground? And let Starship fall through the thicker parts of the atmosphere, just like Falcon 9 boosters do. And the simple answer for this is uh, probably, well, I'm, I'm saying probably the simple answer is that as soon as you flip, you start accelerating, and that means you need to get rid of more velocity again. So I think on they probably considered this, I'll say, but the tr quick transition and landing means that you end up using less fuel. And since you have to have use these smaller header tanks, the amount of time you can be firing those engines is very limited. Um, and by the way, Elon Musk confirmed yesterday that they tried to land the vehicle slower. They commanded higher thrust on that single Raptor, but the thrust didn't ramp up and they ended up hitting the ground faster. And regardless of whether those landing legs had locked in position, it was too fast for those legs and they would have been crushed either way. Uh, okay, uh, Kestutis Burba. That's a cool name, by the way. It sounds like someone from Star Wars. Um, on behalf of Kaunas Makerspace, can you tell us about amateur rocketry projects that impressed you most? Uh, I'm going to say, like, the amateur rocket projects that always impress me most is when I meet an amateur rocketer, a rocketry person, and they just show me the rocket, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is cool. I, I think it is amazing that, <coughs> you know, people have now managed to make amateur rockets that can reach space. It's something I would love to spend time on, but there's only 
so many hours in the day. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could tell you more about this, but I, I do. I am just continually impressed by amateur rocket makers, which really isn't the answer you're looking for. I, I can't name anyone specific off the top of my head. Um, okay, MD Lund. Hi, Scott. I would love to hear more about structural design challenges in rockets. Obviously, they don't stand on their nozzles. Uh, you, you have previously talked about pressure inside the tanks being parts of structural rigidity, but you'd like to see, hear more about how you support hundreds of tons of rocket with the lowest mass possible. So, structural engineering of rockets, boy, that is, I mean, that's like a whole engineering course on that. But yeah, I mean, rockets won't support their weight on their engines. They will have hard points along the bottom where they mate to the landing pad somehow, or they will have legs there. But just making the rocket uh, hold together and not flex, that is non-trivial. Like, as, as we said, the um, Atlas, the early Atlas, it used pressure-stabilized forms. But, uh, you know, that's annoying because if you want to move the vehicle around, then you need to keep it pressurized. Most vehicles these days will have that smooth tank exterior hides the fact that on the interior there will be structural material to hold those flat panels rigid. Uh, now, these are typically called rid, uh, ribs and stringers. So ribs run like around the tank and stringers run vertically. And these are either welded on the inside or sometimes they're formed onto the inside. There's another trick that can be used um, or another type of structure that's commonly used in rockets, and that's like isogrids or orthogrids. So again, what you do is, if, if you imagine, right, the flat, you want your external skin to be as thin as possible, to be as light as possible. But if you make it thin, then it flexes, right? So you add like internal structure on the inside. But making an orthogrid or an isogrid, you have these like as ridges on the interior, like an either a triangular pattern or is one, or which is good because isogrid stand means that it's got like isotropic properties, like whatever way you apply the force, it has the same rigidity. Orthogrids may have squares or hexagons or waffle patterns, I believe. And in that case, the force properties are in are may be different in different directions and that may be desirable because your fuel tank has different loads in different directions. The thing about these grids though is that frequently they are machined into the panel so you get your large fuel tank panels and you might make them instead of making them like you know a few millimeters thick you might make them a few centimeters thick and then you put them in a giant cnc milling machine which just goes in and carves out 90 percent of the material leaving these interior ribs to strengthen the panel but leave it very very thin and if you look at the panels the easiest place to see this actually is if you look at any of the construction photos of starliner or orion or dragon you will see panels like this all the time where they need the panels to be as light as possible, but also very rigid in the face of the loads expected of them. Now they don't use that on Starship. That is that has you know stringers and ribs attached, welded inside, and that's you can see this on the outside because they have to weld these on right now, and that discolors the metal on the outside. So you'll see these patterns of vertical and horizontal lines on it. Uh, yeah, this is like a whole massive subject that I can't possibly get into. I, I mean, I'm not sure I could ever possibly do it justice, but sure, uh, that's that's uh, fascinating. Um, yeah, I think one more, one more, we're at 14 minutes. So Garth Leck. Hi, Scott, I love your videos. I love your comment. I was wondering if you have a favorite solution slash answer to the Fermi paradox. There seems to be so many potential solutions, including the many different great filters. Uh, it's hard to know which ones are more plausible. I'm gonna say the one that I think is most plausible is everybody just starts disappearing into their own little private video game paradises, you know, VR video games or whatever. Why? spend all that effort to build a spaceship when you can just travel there in your mind and it's the same thing. Like, that, that is one serious possibility. And sure, a civilization could just turn in on itself like that and um, stop making real progress until a real threat emerges and wipes them out completely. Um, that, that would be my answer to the Fermi paradox because I see how easily the human mind is distracted into mundane uh, self-gratification. And 
I am very much guilty of that because I will spend a very long time playing video games when I'm supposed to be making videos for you guys. So yeah, that's uh, a few more questions. I don't know if I'm going to catch up with everything else, but thanks for watching. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>